Hello, good afternoon. You're very welcome to our uh, ASHRAE Ireland uh, webinar today. Let me start by uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dono Ben. Uh, I am a, a past president of the ASHRAE Ireland chapter 2018-2019. Uh, and I will be the, uh, the host and the moderator uh, for uh, today's uh, session. So I'm going to start uh, with a very short introduction, um, and then I'll introduce our, our, our speaker who is uh, waiting and uh, is ready to go. Um, so again, you're all very, very welcome. Um, I'm going to start with housekeeping, uh, just a little bit in, in, in terms of how our webinar is set up. And um, what you'll see on your control panel on the uh, right hand side of, of your screen, uh, most likely, uh, is a series of, of, of buttons. So um, we will talk or uh, we will start with our talk in, in, in about two or three minutes. And um, the talk will be for about 45 minutes. Then there's uh, an opportunity for questions and answers uh, afterwards. And you can see there's a questions tab on the uh, middle right uh, of your um, um, control or your options panel. Uh, you can um, put your questions there. Now, please bear in mind that you're muted by, by default and uh, questions are only possible in, in, in the written format. So feel free to, to uh, type in your question at any time uh, during the uh, talk today. And then we'll do our best uh, at the end of the talk to um, cover as many questions uh, as possible. Uh, there is also a, a, a chat function which allows you to do the same thing, but our, our preference would be for the uh, questions uh, option. And if you have any difficulty, um, you can send your questions uh, during or afterwards by email as well to secretary at ashrayireland.org. Uh, you also find towards the bottom of your uh, options panel a uh, menu which is handouts and there you will find a PDF of uh, today's uh, talk. Um, uh, it's a PDF document of all the, the, the slides and then at the very end um, we will ask you, it will just take a, a brief moment for a, a, a short survey, it's got three questions uh, which will uh, come up. Um, uh, to you uh, at the end of the session. The final point is that today's session uh, is being recorded and it will be available uh, on our uh, ASHRAE uh, website. And I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about ASHRAE and the resources that are available uh, at the end uh, of today's talk. So I'm delighted today to be able to, to welcome um, Professor Chandra Sakar. Uh, Professor uh, Sakar is uh, based at the National uh, University of Singapore and uh, he is a fellow of, of ASHRAE and you can see here a, a summary of, of his research interests uh, which span thermal comfort, ventilation, uh, indoor air quality, energy and HVAC systems. He has an extensive number of publications uh, published to date in, in journals and conferences and has delivered several keynote uh, presentations at ASHRAE and other events. Um, Chandra is an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer since 2006 and uh, quite regularly speaks uh, worldwide. And he's very actively involved in a number of, of ASHRAE uh, committees, both at ASHRAE uh, Global and also uh, in Singapore. The title of uh, Chandra's talk today is Advanced Room Air Distribution Strategies for Effective Airborne uh, Infection Control, which is very relevant and pertinent in, in the context of the uh, current pandemic, uh, which we're all working our way through. So at this point, I'm going to uh, hand over to, to Chandra. So this will take a moment while we uh, change uh, our speaker mode. And uh, once that's done, um, uh, Chandra, the floor is yours and uh, we look forward uh, to your talk. Thank you so much, uh, Donald. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. We can indeed. And I okay, think you great. should have control now. Yep, I do. 
and just to make sure that you are able to see my uh, first slide. Uh, yes, I can to... see it, and um, I okay, hope everyone wonderful. else can see it as well. Okay, wonderful. So the slide can be seen, you can hear me well, and that's all we need to get started on our webinar. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Donald, for uh, in the first place, inviting me to speak at this uh, webinar. Um, well, uh, it, it's not in person, but uh, technology has made several things possible in the last year or so. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this uh, webinar and, and talk about um, a subject matter that's uh, very close to, to me and I'm sure to a lot of us, because as Donald, you rightly said, we are in the middle of this pandemic and uh, anything that we can um, do and, and be aware of and probably implement to mitigate the uh, transmission as well as to ensure that the buildings and, and the environment that we have for people are safe. So I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this event and be able to share some of the work that we have done in the past. Interestingly enough, this is not a work that I just did within the last year or so. Is part of one of my PhD students' work done uh, probably about six six years ago, seven years ago. Is just the relevance of it, uh, uh, the timing of it in terms of its relevance could not have been any better. So it's titled Advanced Roommate Distribution Strategies for Effective Airborne Infection Control. This is an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer event, and it's brought to you from the Society CTTC Chapter Technology Transfer Committee. And I'm sure at the end of this event, uh, you would be required to or asked by uh, the organizers to do a quick survey of the of the event and the talk. I appreciate if you can get that done. Uh, ASHRAE, just a half a minute uh, uh, mention about what ASHRAE has to offer for all of us. Um, I mean, I'm here speaking to you, but at the same time, I gain a lot by being involved in ASHRAE activities and technical committees, standardization committees. Um, and then a whole bunch of different uh, technical spheres that ASHRAE has possible for volunteers. I'm sure a lot of you already are plugged into some of these activities. And if not, it, uh, it's always a, there's always a good time to see what, what is out there based on your interest, your aptitude, and probably where you can contribute the most. Um, this particular uh, talk today is uh, accredited by uh, AIA in the US, American Institute of Architects, and also the USGBCI for one credit hour. And uh, just to keep keep this in perspective about uh, uh, the kind of you know professional development uh, points or units that one can get if if indeed that is uh, something that one might be looking for. I won't go through the description that's there in the handout. You can read the abstract of it. I would probably just very, very briefly uh, go through the learning objectives. Uh, there are four that I've outlined here. What I would like to talk about is to distinguish between different types of what I'm calling as typical room air distribution strategies. I think the point that I would like to really make at the outset is what happens in the micro environment of a person in a building irrespective of the type of building we're talking about, be it commercial building, residential, healthcare, even in uh, micro environments like in transportation environments, in, in uh, trains, suburban trains, buses, aircraft, cabin. So it's the air distribution that's critical because that's what we are going to be occupying in that huge volume of space in terms of our interaction with the air around us. I'll talk to you very briefly again about the key issues of airborne infectious disease spread and how that could be seen in the context of uh, indoor environments. Number three is really what my main focus of the talk is. It's about the idea of uh, bringing in ventilation air to the person's breathing zone, as well as being able to extract the contaminated air from and around the person who might potentially be the source of infection. And as all of us, we have learned and we have understood in the last 12 months or so, asymptomatic cases are the ones that uh, are being the most difficult to, to, to identify and to control. So the assumption that if you are in a building, there could potentially be a source of infection, why not we look at it from the perspective of extracting it from the source? Um, that's a much wider perspective that I'm talking to you right now. 
but the focus of this presentation is about a particular setting and that's the healthcare setting and that's item number three objective three and fourth one is really when i'm talking about this new and probably a different way of uh, a distribution we ought to be able to understand some of the performance indicators so i will talk to you about what those performance indicators are right let me proceed the first thing that a lot of us try to understand during this pandemic is uh, okay there's something going on we we're all aware and it's global what kind of strategies that we could think about it is it, always a bundle of strategies there's no there's just no one single thing that one can do and we can be on top of this issue so very simply, if we can get rid of the pathogen or the source control, wonderful. Then there are the engineering controls, and that's really the focus of what I'll be talking about today because HVAC systems and distribution systems are part of the engineering side of things in a built environment. And then we have, and that the concept really is you separate the people from the pathogen. So exposure control is the key, key word that we are trying to address here. Administrative controls, things related to safe distancing and the kind of checks one, had to, one has to do before entering a building. For instance, in Singapore, before I enter any building outside, there is a contact tracing mechanism that's uh, set up on an island-wide basis. And it's the same app that we use and to just register that we have entered this building from this time to this time. And that's part of the administrative control that pretty much uh, implemented throughout Singapore now for uh, almost about eight, 10 months. Then we have the very, very downstream and at the individual level, the PPE, the personal protective equipment sort of thing, uh, gloves, wearing gloves, masks, gowns, shields, and all that sort of thing. So it's very hard to pinpoint and say which one particular thing that we should be focusing on. I guess as we are now beginning to understand and appreciate the fact that we probably have to do a bit of all of these things as we move along. One, one of these days, very soon in the not too distant future, I would imagine we would have been successful in getting rid of the pathogen and that's what the whole world is looking forward to. In the meantime, when this pandemic is still with us, we need to think about ways and means to manage it. So my focus is on the engineering control and very specifically related to the room air distribution aspects of it. So what is the current practice when it comes to room air distribution? How is it evolving? If we look at uh, what I show on this slide, it, it, it's very clear. It's, uh, uh, it, it's pretty evident that the three different types that I'm showing here are something that I don't need to explain too much. Mixing ventilation. Uh, and, and we are talking about mixing ventilation as um, supply from the ceiling, you know, ceiling supply diffuser, and you can have return grills located at uh, strategic predetermined locations. And the idea is we try to create this uniform mixing in the room, and then we extract the air out of this room. And of course, we, we can talk about what we want to do with that air. A good part of that air is recirculated in a lot of uh, the countries in the world, including here in Singapore. So we can talk about what we want to do with the recirculated air. Now, I'm not going into details of the kind of treatment that one could do with that. Potentially, there are several, and that is part of uh, the focus that, uh, say, you know, uh, professional societies, uh, ASHRAE and RIVA and, and, and guidance documents from other countries talk about, you can handle the contaminated air in uh, in ways that it could be filtered, it could be cleaned, disinfected using uh, several technologies, and then you could bring it back to the occupied zone. So that part of it is not the main focus of my discussion, but when that air comes to the person's breathing zone or the micro environment, there is this element of distribution that uh, we would want to focus on. That's really what I am focusing on in this talk. Displacement ventilation, you supply from the floor, you have a, uh, a, a source of, uh, you know, a heated object, person, computers, or whatever that, that, that buoyancy driving force could be. And then you have the airflow, airflow going up towards the ceiling and one could extract it from them. This is part of the stratified distribution strategy that we normally talk about. And then of course we have the underflow air distribution systems. Very similar to the DB displacement ventilation concept, except that with the UFAT system, you have a little bit of a 
momentum driven throw at the outlet and there's a little bit of a mixing that can happen at the uh, say up to the face level and then you have the stratification built up by the thermal plume of the person and taking it all the way up to the ceiling so these three systems are pretty much common in most parts of the world and in most buildings and i can i can kind of very safely tell you in Singapore, we are probably almost like 80, 90% of the mixing ventilation concept. I, I'm guessing in Europe, you probably have a good good percentage, a, a high percentage of displacement ventilation systems, um, maybe some on underflow, uh, but these are the, the, the main strategies that we have in terms of the current air distribution profile. So why did I talk about that? Because that's what we have in buildings currently. So with the air distribution that we now can understand and accept as being important in terms of how things move within the space. So if I have an infected person in the space, the exhaled air that can contain the infectious aerosols, the virions, the, the concentration of that, how it gets transmitted within the room is definitely a function of how the air flows. So there, there is a group of, um, international scientist that was part of this group. We, we, we got this article out uh, uh, last year, probably about the April time, just about a year ago, where we made the point about the importance of uh, airborne transmission in as much as the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus transmission is concerned. And then there was a commentary again by the same group and enhanced by several other scientists to say that we really need to address the airborne transmission of this SARS-CoV-2 because acknowledging that it is a means of transmission helps us to look at potential ways and means of managing it and, and we can manage it there are there are technical solutions that we can implement in buildings to ensure uh, or well i would say to ensure to mitigate the risk of exposure to people who are in the building um, i would probably just spend a minute or two to explain the concept of what we are talking about in terms of the different modes of transmission. If I look at a room and then I have an infected person, a source of infection, then the green are the people who are susceptible to be infected or catching that infection from another person. And we, we, we talk about this uh, five to six feet distance uh, in Singapore, mm -hmm. it's one meter. So there is this one to two meter kind of uh, distance that we are talking about where we say that maintain that social distancing then you minimize the risk of exposure. So what exactly are we referring to? When a person is involved in any vocalization activity, it could just be normal breathing, talking, singing, chanting, coughing, sneezing. I put it in that context because with the last word that I said sneezing would carry the released particles further away from the infected source. In other words, that has the potential to be spread a lot further away in the room, which is the reason masks are a, a, a very good strategy of controlling the release of the infected particles from the infected person to a, a distant location within the room. We are not talking about room to room transmission. We are really talking about within the room, you have an open plan space or you have a small room with three, four, five people. There's potentially this concern that things could be floating in the air. So when, when a person coughs or talks or exhales, you know, contaminated air, it's not that it change, it ranges in size from at one distance is going to be this size and then it goes to uh, some other size. So we're talking about a continuum of particles that are released and you can have anywhere up to about 100 micron in size. They are the large particles, 100 micron and larger. Obviously, they're going to settle down the blue droplet. They're going to settle down. And these are the contact modes of transmission that you would say, if somebody is within that short range, the particle could come and hit on the person's uh, face, nose, hand, and then you rub it on your, on your nose or whatever, then there could be a transmission through the contact uh, uh, droplet mode. Things settling on the floor could also be suspended back and we have that fomite transmission or resuspension. These are all possible transmission with the large particles that are settled down. What about those particles? Once they are released, they get desiccated in the environment and then the size gets smaller because the SARS-CoV-2 virus is 125 nanometers, 0.125 microns. Even in a five micron 
size droplet, which is the water droplet coming from the exhaled air, it could potentially carry the virus and, and, and be suspended in the air and float around. So we are talking about particles even between 5 and 20 or 30 microns that, that can Hi, Chandra. I understand the sound seems to have just stopped. around the person beyond. Uh, did, did I hear somebody? Yeah, yeah, Chandra. This is Donal here. For some reason, there was dropout for about thirty seconds, but I think you're good again. So please continue. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, so we could talk about short-range airborne transmission, the aerosol transmission. Then there could be this small particles that are in the air that can go further away from, from the person here within the room scale. So we are talking about long range airborne route, aerosol transmission or the airborne transmission within the room scale. Uh, we don't have too much evidence to say that things are going through the air duct back into the AHU. Um, although there are some studies that have documented and found some evidence of uh, uh, RNA uh, uh, samples in the recirculated air at the air handling unit. But predominantly, we're talking about the room scale. The fomite transmissions are the ones that happens from the surface as the droplets get deposited and somebody touches that surface. Hence, there's so much emphasis on contact and, and to ensure that we don't transmit through that contact mode. So I think we should be looking at all the different modes of transmission in order to be able to come up with solutions that would be part of a bundle of strategies rather than determining as one single solution that can solve the problem. So let's move on. Uh, and this is the study I was referring to. There was this study that was published uh, in November last year, 2020, where they found that uh, they, they, they actually found airborne dispersal of SARS-CoV-2 in COVID-19 wards, 50 meter distance from the patient room vent opening. So there, there, there is this possibility it could be there through that path as well. So let me move on now to the, the air distribution itself, a little bit more into the details of how you want to look at it. HVAC system, the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems, no matter which part of the world we talk about it, the ventilation is a critical component there. We, we do need to have outdoor air ventilation being brought in, and we need to ensure that it reaches the person's breathing zone to be able to dilute the contaminants, and generally for good indoor air quality, that's critical. All the more reason in the context of this pandemic, we need to get rid of the exhaled air that are contaminated. So the advanced room air distribution concept or the strategy primarily focuses on the airborne infection control. In other words, what can we do in the micro environment, air distribution, to be able to uh, remove these contaminants, remove whatever infection source that can exist in the air, enhance the indoor air quality and i just add this word building resilience here because that's really what we are looking for going forward into the future buildings need to be resilient to be able to adapt itself in terms of the operation of the systems there's been an evolution of this uh, advanced room air distribution strategies uh, it's not something that just started almost two decades of personalized ventilation kind of research and this slide just summarizes all the key advantages of that um, we, that, we have done several studies ourselves just to give you a sense of what do we get with personalized ventilation. Uh, when you see something like this, it's 26 degrees room air temperature, 23 degrees the personalized air temperature through a local air terminal device sitting in front of the person on a desk. And then um, 15 is the liters per second per person that we are providing as outdoor air, conditioned outdoor air. Look at the ventilation effectiveness. Typically, the higher the ventilation effectiveness, the better it is because uh, you, you can see this as um, the air, the outdoor air being, um, you know, it's doing a much better job in effectively diluting the local microenvironment contaminants. And that's what we're looking for. Something with a higher ventilation effectiveness, 
something that I'll soon talk to you about as um, uh, uh, you, you increase the um, uh, so-called uh, exposure reduction of the contaminant to the person, the susceptible person. These are all good strategies we want to look at. That was an environmental chamber study I reported to you just a minute ago. This one is a study that we did with personalized ventilation and underfloor and displacement ventilation, comparing that with the ceiling supply in the field. So this is, uh, you know, one of our um, uh, existing buildings. It was retrofitted to be a net zero energy building. And these systems were installed like here in this part of the slide, the green ones are the personalized ventilation devices. My main point of showing this slide to you is this one, where the ones that I just popped up with the green background, this green highlighted, look at the air exchange effectiveness values. These are much, much higher than one, which you typically get with the mixing ventilation air distribution system. This is the mixing ventilation. It's about one, 1.16. Uh, that, that's about what you get. Whereas with the air, with the uh, uh, personalized ventilation and the underflow system, or just the displacement ventilation, we get a much higher air exchange effect. And these are good things to happen in a room, in as much as the room air distribution is concerned. So I just very quickly gave you two studies where we did, where we had done in the past, where we observe from empirical measurements that the effectiveness improves. Then there's a whole bunch of studies in the literature. You can again read this from my handout material. I won't go into it. Uh, again, the key point here is doing something at the micro environment. Either you supply clean air or you extract the contaminated air is a much better strategy. That's really the key message over there. I will share with you for the rest of my talk from here on about the specific work that we were involved in. And this was a research project done uh, between 2011 and 13, as you can see here on this slide. And we were trying to look at personalized ventilation and personalized exhaust system. And you might be wondering what, what, what that means in terms of uh, a concept. The concept is very simple. It's right here on the slide. Our, our setting was uh, healthcare. And we said, typically in a healthcare setting, be it a, a clinic, a polyclinic or consultation, uh, room sort of a thing, specialist clinic. There's always, you know, the scenario where you have the specialist or the doctor in the room, and then it's part of that, you know, layout of that that space, that that hospital or the or the whole um, floor setup. The room has its own air distribution system. There is a door, and you have patients walk in and out, and then you have consultation happening within that room. So imagine there is a small room, a doctor sitting there. There's a table and your patient walk in and so many of them walk in and out. And at the first time of consultation, there is this um, uh, uncertainty as to the extent of infection that the person, the patient might be carrying. So we are talking specifically about that setting. So here is the doctor. This We, we work this through mannequins. Here is the mannequin. This represents the doctor. This is the infected uh, person, the patient. So when this person comes and consults the doctor, he or she is going to release this um, contaminated air. And the whole idea is to try and see, how can I mitigate the exposure to this doctor? And that's really the purpose of this research project. There's also another question that we were trying to address before we went into the infection control study. And that was to see if I have a concept of, uh, say, a clean air supply to this person, the doctor, and I have an exhaust here. Uh, how can I manage the use of these two to always ensure that this doctor is protected from, uh, or rather, is it the risk of exposure to the doctor is minimized? So that's the basis. I'll share with you two experiments. That's all the time I would have to talk to you about. And here's the first one. And the idea is personalized ventilation, clean air coming to the doctor. There's the exhaust device. And we were working with the ceiling supply mixing ventilation as one background system. And then there is a separate study with the displacement ventilation system. So we have two, two studies done sequentially, once with mixing ventilation as the background system, another time with the displacement ventilation as the background system. So we wanted to see, can this exhaust device, which is now integrated with the chair. So if a person is sitting on this chair, can this exhaust device 
pull the clean air towards that person within a degree of freedom around this workspace. So you can see this as being applicable to the consultation setting, or you can even extend this to other settings, like even an office setting or other types of applications. What, what did we get in terms of our results? Here is the ATD, the personalized ventilation, and these are the different positions of the person sitting on the chair with an integrated exhaust device. And the idea is to see how can I get the air always go towards me. Different configurations, I won't go into those details. We actually studied 144 different cases. So what did the results tell us? Before I show you the result, it's good to know what the indicator is. Remember I spoke to you about the performance indicator. Going back to this diagram, here is the person. I'm trying to get the clean air to this person through the personalized ventilation. So we talk about an indicator called personal exposure effectiveness. This was uh, first kind of computed by Melikov from Denmark. So this is a simple equation. It's, it's just three different uh, parameters that we are measuring. We use tracer gas. I measure the concentration at the supply side. Then I measure the concentration at the breathing zone of the person. Then I also measure here in the personalized air. And I also have something in the exhaust, which is like the average of all the room air. So look at this numerator here when there is no personalized ventilation. So the concentration that I would have in terms of the breathing zone of the person is the same as what is there at the incoming point. The moment I bring in the personalized ventilation with PV, I'm going to get this concentration lowered. So in other words, the idea of being able to reduce the exposure through the personalized ventilation, that is the measure that this indicator is telling us. Again, higher the number, the better it's going to be. We get these results, personalized exposure effectiveness with mixing ventilation, with displacement ventilation, with five liters per second and 10 liters per second. You just need to look at one, the others are kind of you know uh, replicated. So I, I just want to highlight here, when the person is sitting right in front of the personalized ventilation at terminal device, we get these values no exhaust, we still get a fair amount of effectiveness. And that's what the clean air does, the personalized ventilation clean air does. It blows towards me and removes any contamination that's coming from elsewhere in the room. But when you bring in an exhaust, look at the red one, the green one, it tends to get more of the air, clean air towards me, it increases. And these are the different angular positions. So if I move to my right, or if I move to my, towards my left, it's still able to get some, it's not, I mean, it can't do everything, but it does to a large extent. Gives me a degree of freedom around the place where I was, where I'm seated. That's the first experiment. This, okay, I mean, this is just to illustrate that that's what we're trying to explore, straight ahead and to the angular positions. Then we have, uh, we measured the air velocity. Is it too drafty? We get about 1.6 meters per second with personalized exhaust of 20 liters per second. And I can tell you for our tropically acclimatized subjects, 1.6 meters per second is not unusual. I have a fan that's running in this room right now. And if I measure the airspeed around me, it's probably going to be around that. So we, we don't really mind, but I'm aware, you know, those coming from uh, temperate climates, uh, you may find 1.6 meters per second a little bit on the high velocity side, but that's what we're talking about. You know, there are strategies that might be more relevant and applicable in terms of air movement in certain climates than the other. The second experiment, probably the more important one from an infection control perspective, our idea was to see how can we use the supply, the personalized ventilation, together with the exhaust as different permutation combination to ensure the doctor is well protected. Where is the doctor in this scenario? Here is a doctor, HP, the healthy person. And here is the patient, infected person or the patient. Patient, doctor. The doctor has clean air coming towards him, personalized ventilation. And then the exhaust, look at the, 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 the infected person, there's an exhaust on the top. And this chair could also have the shoulder exhaust. We find that, you know, you, you would find that we were trying to place this in different locations to see which one works the best. And very simply, we determined an exhaust at the patient level or the patient chair and a clean supply to the doctor was the best combination. That was our hypothesis. I will just share with you shortly that 
actually we were surprised that need not be the best scenario all the time i'll talk to you what that means just in a bit we need two more indicators here apart from the personalized exposure effectiveness which we did using tracer gas in this case we use sulfur hexafluoride for that we used a second tracer gas nitrous oxide and determined two factors intake fraction again the word is very very easy to understand intake fraction means the fraction of the exhaled air from the patient that the doctor is inhaling so the numerator here is how much the doctor is inhaling and the denominator is how much the patient is releasing so the smaller the number the better it is the lower the number the better it is exposure reduction how much of the expo how much of the air that the patient has released the contaminated air how much of that in terms of exposure the doctor gets exposure reduction so this is a term that is the i want to reduce the exposure exposure reduction so as high an exposure reduction as possible is our desire is our goal so intake fraction should be low exposure reduction should be as high as possible what did we get from our studies first class exposure effectiveness again as i said we were doing two different scenarios mixing ventilation and displacement ventilation we were using personalized ventilation alone or personalized ventilation in combination with an exhaust Remember that patient had the exhaust, the doctor had the personalized ventilation. So this is a clear indication that personalized ventilation alone, you get benefit, no doubt, but when the exhaust comes in, it just improves even better. So we do know as a fact that the uh, personalized exposure effectiveness has enhanced when we have personalized ventilation and personalized exhaust. Intake fraction. Remember what I said about the intake fraction. What fraction of the exhaled air from the patient the doctor is exposed to? In other words, how much he is inhaling. The smaller the number, the better it is. We are talking about a scenario or a situation where the red is the patient, the mannequin, uh, which is representing the patient. Green is the mannequin that is representing the doctor. And to give you a sense of how realistic our, our whole experimental setup is, I want to just highlight that the red one is a breathing thermal mannequin. Apart from the body representing, you know, body temperature of the person, it also has an artificial lung. We simulate the normal breathing cycle. So the red mannequin is constantly throwing out carbon dioxide, which is represented by nitrous oxide in our case. So we use that as a tracer which is released in the exhaled air, and then we try to track how much of that comes to the doctor who is seated some distance away, right? So that, that's, the, that's the basis in which we do these experiments. Look at that intake fraction. When there is nothing, no personalized exhaust, the levels are pretty high. And then the moment we bring in exhaust, look at how much of a reduction we get. Significant reduction drop in the intake fraction. What about another configuration? The doctor and patient can have different configurations in the consultation room in the healthcare setting. So here they are at right angles. Here they were at 45 degrees to each other. And then this position where the doctor is standing to come and probably examine the patient. Remember the patient is always sitting in the chair that is integrated with an exhaust device. So no matter what happens to the chair, the exhalation coming from the patient is being sucked either from the top or from the side of the chair through the shoulder exhaust. We call that the top exhaust or the shoulder exhaust. In all these six scenarios, you find that the exhaust and the PV, personalized ventilation, helps to reduce the intake fraction. Of course, with mixing ventilation and displacement ventilation, you find slightly different results. Uh, in this case, for the intake fraction, the mixing ventilation seems to be a better kind of a, a, a scenario to operate these uh, supply personalized ventilation supply and or exhaust devices exposure reduction what does this entail the doctor is seated some distance from the patient and we're talking about the exposure reduction to the doctor to the healthy person again higher this reduction the better it is if the exposure reduction is increased 
obviously the doctor is getting less of that to inhale in his inhalation zone. Look at this percentage figure here. When we have personalized ventilation only, we still get benefit about 50% with mixing ventilation and slightly reduced for the displacement ventilation. But look at what's happening here. The moment we bring in only the exhaust, top personalized exhaust, things are being sucked from the top above that. I'm sorry, Sakar. I think the sound seems to have gone again. Uh, this is Donal here, just for about 10 seconds. We, we still cannot hear you, uh, Sakar. The personalized exhaust alone is able to significantly improve the exposure reduction. So our initial hypothesis that you need push, which is the clean air supply to the doctor, and pull out of the patient's area microenvironment zone, we thought that both would be necessary to, to, to really result in um, the reduced exposure to the doctor. Yes, it certainly helps because when the doctor is getting clean air, personalized air, it, it gives that extra sense of, uh, you know, of, of protection or safety. But what we observed through our experimental results is if you have an exhaust device at the patient level, at the infected person level, it is already a significantly enhanced strategy to be able to remove the contamination from around the source of infection. And that to us was an important finding just to look at the relative difference between what happens if I just use exhaust what happens if I use 10 liters per second or 20 liters per second? What happens if I combine the exhaust with personalized ventilation to the healthy person? All these are good strategies. If we can implement that, certainly in, in, in cases like the healthcare setting or the consultation room context that I'm talking to you about, there are distinct advantages that we could see purely based on the results that we got from our exper experiments. So what's happening for these three key performance indicators? Personalized exposure effectiveness increases. We've seen that in the results. Intake fraction is lower, and that also we could clearly determine from our computations based on the empirical measurements using tracer gas. Exposure reduction increases quite substantially, which again shows that the exposure of the contaminant released by the patient to the doctor is considerably reduced when we have a personalized ventilation integrated with personalized exhaust system. So in conclusion, I would like to just uh, uh, very quickly go through what, what I spoke to you about this evening, uh, this evening for me and to your, at your luncheon event. I started talking to you about basic strategies of room air distribution, the current practice that is mixing ventilation, displacement ventilation and underflow air distribution. Then we looked at um, uh, some advanced room air distribution strategies, personalized ventilation systems. And, and I mean, I, I just went through that very, very quickly. Again, with personalized ventilation systems, there are a whole suite of studies that are done with, can you supply from the, from in front of the person, from the table, from the sidewall partitions, from the top, from the ceiling itself, we have done such studies as well. So there's a whole suite of personalized ventilation studies that have been done. Local exhaust systems, we've done what I shared with you in a healthcare setting context. There are studies done with the hospital wards, for instance. If you can suck the air out of the bed area, that's also another strategy that can help in mitigating contamination or cross infection occurring in hospital setting. And in general, the hospital ventilation does have you know the, the the principle of separating clean zones from the not so clean zones and i think in that context the hvac system and the air distribution principles play a very important role and specifically in my talk i spoke to you about the work that we did with the personalized ventilation and the personalized exhaust system and the key finding that we get here was even if you don't do personalized ventilation if we can do personalized exhaust local exhaust that helps that's a good thing to do. With that, I would conclude my presentation and thank you for your attention. And I'm just going to end uh, right now by saying 
Uh, I think Donald, you want to say something? Uh, are we taking questions at this time? Thank you very much, Chandra, for a, a very interesting uh, talk, and we really appreciate it um, seeing the latest in, in, in this very interesting field. Yes, we are taking questions, so if people would like to, or if anybody has a question, if you could type it uh, into the uh, question box. Um, and while I'm waiting to see if there are any questions, um, perhaps I could uh, just ask one question uh, initially. Uh, one thing, Chandra, it, it, it seemed to me that the, the inclusion of personalized exhaust uh, ducts, let's say, is, is, is really very, very important. And it does uh, complement the personalized ventilation uh, quite significantly. Um, what effect, or uh, what is the effect of, in terms of multitudes of those? Um, I, I know you showed the case with two. Do you think two is is, is sufficient for for for, for most uh, scenarios, or uh, would you have any thoughts on that? Oh, you mean the number of devices? Yes, the number of exhaust devices. Yes, exhaust devices. So our thinking was uh, not to have it fixed. Um, in the location, as in the ceiling or the fixed partitions in the space. So we wanted to study it being integrated with the chair. So the number of chairs equal to the number of occupants could be in any space. In that case, in the in the healthcare setting, uh, our, our notion was um, the patient. Okay, typically a person who is a source of infection. He could be he or she could be moving around in a space. Asymptomatic cases, they could be moving around. So when they are moving around, of course, we would have to see that as transient cases. But if they are working in a space, uh, or in this case, the patient consulting the doctor, we want to capture from as close as possible to the source of infection. In which case, our best thought process then was: can we have have it integrated with the chair? and say that the patient will be sitting on the chair when the doctor consults him. Um, if your general question is, if you were to see it being widely applied, maybe in the context of a ward in the hospital or the lobby area of a consultation uh, in a room in the hospital, we would probably have to you know, do some further evaluation to see how many that might be necessary. That's an interesting question, though. We'll have to study it from the point of view of how much, how many devices one would need for sucking things out of a given volume of space in a manner that could be considered uh, effective enough? We, we did not do that study though. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Now I see there's um, one or two or three other questions. So um, let me go to the first one, who's from Michael Dawkins. And the question is as follows, have you any practical applications where personal ventilation has been integrated into furniture, that is desks or chairs, uh, for example, which are commercially available? Well, we, 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 I'm aware of uh, um, some applications in, uh, uh, in, in Denmark and also in some of the, uh, well, not many, some buildings in the US as well. The, the way they try to incorporate that, you're absolutely right, in incorporating or integrating that with the furniture is the way to go. So if we're talking about office environment, office partitions, uh, they could be part of the partitions through through a, something very similar to what we see in our cars or we see in the, in the aircraft cabin. It, it's just an opening that you would need to have integrated through the partition, you know, and it can come to the person's uh, breathing zone. Um, unfortunately, until say the beginning of last year, uh, when when we when I'm not the only one who talks about personalized ventilation, there are a couple of other of my colleagues, collaborators from Denmark and 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 uh, you, know, you know Hong Kong and elsewhere who talk about it. People say that's a great idea, sounds good. Your your findings are interesting, uh, but how do I get it going in the real world? So they really did not seem to have been that push or the drive uh, to, to get these things going. And my, my, my looking forward into the future of crystal ball thing is perhaps part of building designs in the future, we ought to be looking at more what I would call micro environmental air distribution strategies and personalized ventilation, personalized exhaust or whatever you want to call it, task ventilation, 
local exhaust. These are nice things, the right things to do perhaps, and uh, it'll help us in uh, future uh, pandemics or, or you know whatever we'll probably have to contend with in the future. So that, that's my thought on that. Thank you, uh, Chandra. Now we have one or two other questions. So uh, the next question, first of all, uh, is from Connor Murray and he, he thanks you for a super uh, presentation. And the question is, uh, the use of face coverings is really important to reduce the projection of virus infected aerosols. Uh, in your experiments, is the test source IP wearing a face covering? And in your graphics, I don't see this. If not, are you planning to assess the difference? I guess that's the difference of with a face covering or without right. a face covering. No, we did not do with and without. Uh, our studies were with the mannequin uh, kind of spewing out contaminated air uh, all the time. So you're absolutely right. There are some studies that I'm aware of that have been, uh, if not if not peer reviewed publication yet, they are in the, uh, you know, uh, preprint uh, zone at the moment with mass and without mass and there are some visualization uh, uh, you know images that have also been um, uh, presented it's very clear the face masks do prevent uh, a lot of the particles from getting disseminated further away from the infected person so it's to protect others uh, in my view and less so to protect myself and of course, when you protect others, uh, you're also protecting yourself in a way because the same applies to the other person wearing a mask and that person's contaminated air or exhaled air doesn't come to you, right? So you're, you're right with the mask. And that's the reason why in a lot of countries in Singapore, it's a mandatory requirement. When, when I step out of my house, I need to be masked uh, on the road, in, in the transport, public transport, in my office, uh, as long as I'm alone, I can take my mask off, but the moment somebody walks in, I need to put it on. Um, I've been giving face-to-face -face lectures this semester, and I will need to speak with the mask on. My students are all wearing their masks in the classroom. We have a conventional air distribution system, mixing ventilation system that I spoke to you about. Um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's life. That's reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have one other question from uh, John Smith. Um, and the question is, it's on the issue of a ceiling fan. And, and, and the question is, have you or indeed anybody at uh, the university in US done any studies on the effect of ceiling fan on ventilation effectiveness or infection risk? Um, we have not done experiments related to infection risk. But certainly, we we have uh, we have been studying ceiling fans uh, from uh, thermal comfort and indoor air quality perspective. Uh, my my long and short of ceiling fan and infection control is simply this: at this point in time, the thinking, at least in in, in the in the in the views of uh, several colleagues that I interact with, the thinking is if there is indeed a source of infection in a room and if we are not able to extract it say at source effectively then perhaps the next best thing that we can do in the space is to have uniform mixing elsewhere in the room to that extent mixing is seen as probably a way to manage or, or manage the risk of exposure to other susceptible persons but will I want to use a ceiling fan all the time to cause that mixing uh, all the time? Probably not. Because to me, local source control would still be a preferred option. But if you can't do that, then maybe you spread it everywhere in the, in the same, with the same thinking that is going to result in a diluted concentration of virions throughout the space. But we can't leave it at that, right? We got to be able to dilute that contaminated air from the room. So you still need to have effective dilution. So your ventilation rate cannot be compromised. Your general ventilation rate cannot be compromised and that need to be uh, working well. So th these are still discussion points. It's a very you know topical discussion point. I'm involved in some uh, discussions in, in some forum where we are questioning ourselves so what's the right strategy in a room should we go for mixing 
it it may be a good idea in in several instances but probably not the 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 same solution to be applied in all situations so there are there are ways goes back to the fundamental point of room air distribution we need to acknowledge that the room air distribution plays an important role in the way in which infection control can be better managed good uh, thank you very much chandra for that very comprehensive answer and indeed the other uh, replies uh, as well now i think at this point um we will uh, close the session i have a few slides to to finish so up just I, really to announce our future I ones the, i will pass the uh, uh floor or the screen back to you i'm just trying to see okay. how do i do this it's um uh, yes i think uh, that is have it. Yep, just one moment now. Let me switch myself on. Hopefully this oh, is sharing. working. Okay, I need something here. Um, a change presenter. Uh, Donald Finn. Okay, I've done that. You should be able to get control back now. Super. Um, I think that's it. So let me just put it into presentation mode. So thank you everybody for, for attending today. Uh, it was a really uh, interesting session. And thank you once again, uh, Professor Asikar, for, for making your time available. Uh, I really do believe that the, the ASHRAE uh, Distinguished Lecture uh, format is, is, is a wonderful forum. And it allows us here in Ireland to, to see what's going on right around the entire globe. And it's, um, I think, a great opportunity to both uh, learn about your research and to see the latest things happening in personal uh, or personalized ventilation. But it was also quite interesting to hear about some of the perspectives uh, in Singapore uh, as well. So I will close now. Uh, two or three slides you can see in front of you are upcoming talks. We have uh, uh, a talk for April, May and June. Uh, you can see the, the titles there and you will receive uh, notification about them. Uh, we also hope to have a, a final talk at the end of June. We, we haven't quite finalized it yet, uh, but when we do, we'll bring the, the details uh, of that to you. Um, if I could bring to your attention uh, a little bit about the uh, resources that are available from ASHRAE. Uh, some of them are, are, are here. There, there are uh, free resources, uh, which are here uh, in, in, in the first bullet. Uh, ASHRAE also has a uh, epidemic uh, task force, uh, which indeed uh, you, Chandra, have, have been part of. And there's also uh, position documents available. Uh, for members, there's access to these various resources. And then also there's the ASHRAE Learning Institute, uh, which is freely available uh, to all members. And you can see a little bit more uh, about it here uh, in terms of the various uh, courses that are available uh, for engineering professionals uh, who, who, who may be interested. I'd ask you all to, to keep in touch uh, with ASHRAE, uh, Ireland chapter. This is our, our website here. Uh, I'd encourage you to go on to it. Uh, you can see the upcoming talks and you'll also be able to, to access the recording of today's talk as well as the, the slides that uh, uh, Chandra kindly made available to us uh, in advance. And you can also see there we have various communication ch channels, Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube, uh, where you can uh, get or obtain further background and, and further uh, information. Uh, finally, um, if you wish to join, uh, you, you, you can see our, our uh, subscription uh, possibility there. And I guess the last point is, uh, most importantly, um, as well as thanking you again, Chandra, is to thank our sponsors and our supporters. Um, without you, what we do wouldn't be possible. We really do appreciate your, your support and particularly your financial support. And you can see a list uh, of our supporters here. So we do really appreciate um, uh, your uh, support over uh, the number of years since we were founded and your continued support as well. And finally, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to contact our secretary, uh, Daniel Coakley. You can see his uh, contact details again. So finally, thank you all again, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sikar, for your very interesting talk.
uh, today. Uh, My pleasure. Really you saved your time. Um, that is great. And we hope to see you all again in about three or four weeks' time for our next talk. So thank you again and bye bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Have a great day. Thanks, Donald. Thank you, Karen. Um, if you press file at the top left. File. Yes, thank you. And then you can press end webinar. Okay. And uh, Chandra, if you're still with us, let me see. No, thank you. Just Once left. again, it's just left. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it went quite well overall. Um, at least that's my sense, anyway. <laughs> And um, we did have drop out once or twice for about 10 seconds, but I don't think it affected things very much. Okay, Brilliant. thank you very much. Okay, okay thanks, Talk Donald. Again. All right, bye bye. bye. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Donald. Thank you. Oh, Talk thank later. you, Michael, as well. Yes, okay, great. Okay. Thank you as well. I was bye -bye. here in support. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. I really appreciate that. Okay, take care. Bye now.